Shabbat Shalom. How are y'all doing today? Good. We usually meet, we're like Saturday afternoon people at our congregation in Nashville. So I didn't know 8 o'clock came twice on a Saturday, um, but this has been a wonderful day so far and I hope it continues. I'm kind of looking forward to having the afternoon off. Um, it's a remarkable thing y'all are doing here. And I just want to say it's such a blessing to get to worship with all of you. Um, in a lot of ways, this does feel like home, you know. Um, Chris and I have been joking for the last couple weeks about how we're getting the band back together because it's kind of like the old days. Uh, Chris would lead worship and occasionally I would teach and stuff at church and it, it was always a wonderful experience. And it's so exciting for me. Um, I travel a little bit, um, been involved in the Messianic movement just about my entire life. Um, we used to be able to call it the Messianic movement and now I guess if we're supposed to call it the Hebrew Roots movement, whatever, y'all, y'all know what we're talking about. And what's exciting for me is this time and this stage in history, the Messianic movement and the Hebrew Roots movement is strong. It has never been stronger. It is growing like wildfire. You know, if you judge any movement by what you see on Facebook, you're going to be discouraged. <laughs> but rest assured that the truth is beyond that, and, and the truth is remarkable. Um, yeah, every year we do a big Passover, and this year I think we had 350 people registered just in Nashville alone to come to Passover. And for every year we do it, it's probably 25% of the people, it's their first Passover. Um, God's awakening his people back up, and it's an exciting time to be alive. And I'm excited to be with you this morning because if you think about it, over the course of all of history, for six, 7,000 years of recorded human history, and the infinite decisions and possibilities and genetics and everything that could have happened between then and now, all of history has been leading to this moment right here. So, and that's true of every moment of your life, but I want to say that it's also true for this moment. God has an important message that to share with his community at this time, and it's such a privilege to be a part of the forefront of that. Um, like I said, I've been Messianic Hebrew roots my whole life, um, essentially. And one thing I've noticed over the years is that there is a profound difference between the people who actually let this message change their lives and people who just treat it like it's a field trip to Judaism. Um, but I think the key is, if this stuff does not change your life, on every single aspect of your life, you've missed the point. If it doesn't make you a better husband, father, mother, daughter, citizen, neighbor, employee, leader, whatever your roles may be in life, if it does not make you better and stronger, you've missed the point. And one thing that I... Uh, I want to talk to you about today is this concept of knowing God. We read about and talk about this a lot in Scripture. So many times, Scripture talks about us knowing God. One thing that always sort of touches me, really at my heart, when people ask me, why do you follow the commandments of God? Why do you try to honor the commandments? Obviously, it's hard for us to keep all the commandments, but we try to honor them to the extent that we can. And I think one of the greatest arguments for it is what David told Solomon when David was on his deathbed. Um, his reason, and you see the same sort of reasoning throughout Scripture, especially in Deuteronomy, over and over and over again, you see this message that it's for our good. And this is why David, a man after God's own heart, told his son Solomon why he should. So if you have your Bibles, 1 Kings verse 2, and I'll read the first couple verses, it says, When the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon his son, saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth, he said. So be strong, act like a man, and observe what Yahweh your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and his commands, his laws and his regulations as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go. So here we have the original prosperity gospel. But it's the truth. It's something we see throughout scripture. The commandments of God were not a hurdle that they were supposed to overcome. They were instructions that they were supposed to embrace and walk in so that they could flourish and prosper. And in this case, have success in everything that you do. So one thing that kind of eats me alive is when we look around our communities, you know, I think we're very blessed here in America, especially, but around the world. How often do we really feel like we're having success in everything that we do? And in those moments where we aren't having success, how often do we realize this truth that the commandments of God are actually here so we could have that success. And so this is an exciting time to be alive because I think God is starting to bring the pieces back together. 
People are starting to understand things they've never understood before. People are experiencing things. They're actually letting scripture affect their lives in ways that they've never let it affect them before. And it's incredibly encouraging. For me personally, in my ministry, I, I wrote a book a couple years ago, and usually when I'm invited to speak places, that's what people wanted to hear about. It's essentially about marriage, and it's one of these things where like when you uh, start to study, and for me, I'm starting with the Ten Commandments and realizing oh wait, these are marriage commandments. These are the marriage vows between God and Israel. Maybe our marriages should be kind of like that. And going through that and starting to realize like, oh wait, when the Bible says do not covet, covet doesn't mean what we've always been taught covet means. What does it mean when we take our spouse's name in vain? All these sorts of things. And so I wrote a book. Um, it's, a, it's an easy read. Um, there you go. Um, that's essentially all the words in, in priority. Um, we're not going to cover that today. Because the Father, for the last couple of years, has been speaking to me about something else. And where I fall, just, just a little self-disclosure, so buckle your seatbelt. So in the spectrum from boring to crazy, I think you know, most people, somewhere in their faith walk, fall somewhere along the line. And just as kind of a, a standard bearer, and my grandparents, you know, sweetest, most wonderful people. And just because you're boring doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means you're boring. Um, and then you get like the messianics and they tend to be more uh, toward the crazy end of the spectrum. And then there's me. And I, I kind of jump off the end sometimes. Although I wouldn't say it's crazy. I would say well, the stuff that interests me is fascinating. And they would probably say that we just need to hide the kids. Um, and I think if you're here today, if you've been uh, in the messianic Hebrew roots movement for a while, you probably fall somewhere on the spectrum, probably closer to the side that I'm on where we like these things that are interesting. We like these concepts that are big, that change everything. Um, we're kind of done with the milk of the word and we want to move on to the meat. We want to get to the substance, these threads that we see throughout scripture that tie everything together and then transform the entire way that you approach scripture from that moment onward. And so this season, as I was praying about what to talk about, um, you know, I spend a lot of time talking about marriage, um, we're pastors of a church, so congregation similar to this one. So we talk about all sorts of issues. I think one of the uh, blessings of being a pastor is you're forced to encounter a lot of real life. Um, and so we, we discuss all sorts of things. But this topic that the Father keeps bringing me back to for the last couple years um, is something I just can't get away from. Because I've been in this walk just about my entire life. I've heard countless sermons and messages about the temple and the tabernacle and the priesthood and the bride and what it means and the marriage commandments and, you know, all the way back to Jewish jewels and Neil and Jamie Lash were doing their Hebrew roots, marriage, Jewish covenant customs, teachings and all that kind of stuff. And if you've been around for a while, you know what those people are. If you're new to all this, welcome. But we've all heard these things and I've heard them most of my life. But it wasn't until a couple years ago that the Father really started to reveal them to me on a deeper level. And so that's kind of what I want to share today. We have a model. And throughout Scripture, you always see these models of different things. Patterns. Things are cyclical. One thing happens, but it actually represents something else. And if you've gone through the feast cycle, you know what that is. You get, you're able to see the prophetic nature, the historic nature, even in some cases, of the things that the Father's doing. And you realize how even those things that were either historic or are still prophetic can actually impact our lives today. Because when the Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, it's the same for us. Our salvation was a historic event. It is a prophetic event, and it's a current event. And that's true of just about every concept in Scripture. So there's this thing, we talk a lot in Bible and churches all across the world about knowing God. What does it mean to know God? And since we dismiss the kids, I want to be a little more honest with you than probably um, what you may be accustomed to. Maybe not here. Um, my boy Chris usually does a good job, but um, keeping it interesting. But we're all adults here, so I think there are things that we can learn about within our marriages that reveal deeper truths about our relationship with God. So there's this concept in Scripture. You know, we read about in Scripture, and a lot of times people talk about, especially in this movement, you know, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never 
do you? And that word is so pivotal to so many things that we experience in Scripture. Whether or not we know God, and probably more importantly, whether or not he knows us, underscores everything that we do. And it is the, one of the central points of all of Scripture. It is the message of salvation. So this word know, what does it mean when he says, I never knew you? Some of y'all are probably already guessing where we're going with this. And yes, that's exactly where we're going. Genesis 4.1, it says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man-child from Yahweh. Exodus 6, starting in verse 2, it says, God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh, and I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. So again, he's talking about whether or not he knows them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land to which they sojourned. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am Yahweh, and I will bring them out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And a lot of y'all are familiar with this. We've just gone through Passover. These are the promises of Passover. Then I will take you. This is verse 7. I will take you. And the first time that word take you is actually used is referencing back to Adam and Eve when it talks about how Adam took Eve as his wife. And essentially it's the Hebrew word that means to marry someone. Then I will take you for my people and you will be, I will be your God and you shall know that I am Yahweh your God or you will know because I am Yahweh your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession, for I am Yahweh. The entire purpose of the Exodus, the entire purpose of God's cosmic relationship with Abraham and his descendants was so that there could be this marriage, essentially between heaven and humanity. And when I say marriage, marriage is the closest we are able to understand this in our human capacity. I'm sure it is vastly more significant than any of our earthly marriages. But God gave us marriage. He gave us this unification between a husband and a wife as a symbol for the relationship that he wants us to experience with him. And if you think about the importance of marriage on every single aspect, those of you who are married, you know it affects you on every level. Sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad. But it's utterly impactful. It changes your identity. It changes everything you understand about yourself and, of course, everything you understand about the other person. But marriage is also the thing that God gave us because it is the vehicle through which life is created. Obviously, we know this to be true biologically. We know this to be true spiritually. Or even in Scripture, all the way back to Genesis, it talks about how our biology was created in the likeness of God. Even our very bodies, the things that we live in, in this lifetime, were designed to in some way represent God and his will and his commandments, instructions, purposes, will, word, whatever term you want to use. So that's the Old Testament. If we go to the New Testament, there's a Greek word, of course. It's essentially the same, but it's, in English it means to know. Luke 1, verse 34, it says, Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall I... How shall this be? So this is when she's receiving the information that she's going to bear a child. She says, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. The message that Mary received is that through the power of the Holy Spirit, she would essentially know God in a very intimate way. And this is kind of a fun fact, a little trivia. The reason why in ancient cultures, including the Hebrew cultures, why it uses this phrase to know is because humans are unique. And I'm going to keep this PG. So if, you, if there are children, I have children in the room. If there are children in the room, don't worry. Um, but the reason why it uses the phrase to know is that humans are basically the only creatures on earth that actually have face-to-face -face relations. 
Um, in scripture, throughout scripture, it talks about how we will know God face to face. Abraham knew God face to face. And on and on throughout scripture, that is the promise that we are ultimately supposed to have. It's this level of intense relationship that we are supposed to have with God. That the closest thing we can come to understand it in our earthly lives is that relationship between a husband and a wife. Matthew 7, verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is, is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name or your authority perform many miracles. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So this thing that even in this context, you know, in traditional Christianity, they try to make everything about heaven or hell, oftentimes ignoring the very reality of our current existence, the reason why God gave us this life. But even in this moment, where it is talking about sort of the summation of all things, the litmus test for whether or not you get in is whether or not you had a knowing type relationship with him. And so spiritual intimacy is supposed to, is mirrored in our physical intimacy. It's the spiritual intimacy, same with Mary, it's the spiritual intimacy that we receive through the Holy Spirit. That's how we actually know Yeshua and ultimately the Father. It's all about this marriage and this relationship. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12 says, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Again, we're created in the image and reflection of God. Then we shall see face to face. I know in part, then I shall be fully known, even as I am fully known. We have to understand the importance of our marriages on a very tactical level. How we actually execute our marriages will have a profound effect on your life. It will impact generations. It changes the world in the most literal way. But we also have to understand our marriage and our covenant with God. The relationship that we share with him, that same level of intimacy is required at a minimum and perhaps much more. And so the question that I have for you today, a series of questions, I like to ask a lot of questions, even of myself, is do I have the type of relationship that has that level of intimacy? Am I truly more intimate with God than I am with my wife? I think if we're being honest, a lot of us would struggle to answer that question affirmatively. And when I talk about intimacy with God, I'm not talking about the crass physical aspects of our human experience. God is not a man, he's not a physical body. So when I talk about this level of intimacy, in our worldview, we, you know, we've perverted so many things for so long that we have so many negative connotations associated with human intimacy. But God's is pure. It's not just necessarily this physical experience that we get with our spouses. And so it's all about this marriage, though. That's the entire message of the Exodus. That's the message of salvation from Genesis through Revelation. It's this marriage that God desires with his people. At Mount Sinai, God married Israel and 3,000 people died. In the upper room, second chapter of Acts, on the same day in history, God again had this revelation, this level of intimacy with his bride, and 3,000 people were restored to the faith. So we're all in agreement, right? Can I get a yes? Haven't scared anybody yet? There are so, yes, I like that. We're just getting started. When scripture talks about the first marriage, Adam and Eve, Eve was created from the what of Adam. Whenever I ask you a leading question, that means I'm probably trying to lead you astray. She was not created from the rib of Adam. She was created from the side of Adam, as I heard someone say. Nowhere in scripture is that word, that Hebrew word translated as rib anywhere other than in that passage just because of church tradition. Everywhere else, it literally is just talking about a side. Over 40 times in the Old Testament, it's talking about either Eve, 
or it's talking about the side of one of the features of the tabernacle. The ribs of the tabernacle, the structures, the walls, the curtains. It's talking about the east side, the west side, the north side. It talks about all these different aspects. And 40 times, it's talking about this tabernacle structure. And almost exclusively, there's only one case where it's actually talking about a hillside. But in any case, it never is actually referring to a physical, biological rib. It's referring to something much bigger than that. And I think our bodies, our human experiences were designed in the image of God. We were designed to mirror God's plan, God's structure, and his will. The biology of creation, what we experience in our bodies, is an outline for what the Father has created. So it affects us physically, spiritually, emotionally, on every single level. And if we think about... The tabernacle. A lot of y'all have studied. Raise your hand if you've studied about the tabernacle. You've heard a teaching about it. You're familiar with it at least. But general idea, if you've been in this walk for more than five minutes, you've probably heard a lot of teachings about the tabernacle. But the tabernacle was the structure that was actually engineered and designed by God. It was his first. In a lot of ways, it was probably the purest manifestation of the type of worship that he wanted. The intimacy that he wanted with Israel. And if you look at that tabernacle... Not necessarily just as a building, but as a biological diagram. It opens your eyes. Even just the physical structures of it. When you go to the tabernacle, and this is an artist rendering, there are a million artist renderings. I have problems with all of them. But the general structures are the same. First thing you experience is some sort of barrier or curtains. You then sort of enter into the courtyard, and the courtyard is kind of the, the entryway, essentially. In the courtyard, you have two things, essentially, blood and water. You then enter into the actual tabernacle, the place where God knew a Moses, the place where this relationship would occur, where the priests as representatives of the people would continually come in and worship. And inside that tabernacle, you have the, the holy place. You have the menorah, the lampstand. You have the altar of incense and the table of the showbread, representing the body, mind, and spirit. And the people are constantly pouring into these things, feeding these things. It's essentially a byproduct of their sacrifice. So the priests, on behalf of all the people, are coming into this tabernacle. And on approaching that, this is where they sort of have that moment of connection with God. Beyond that, we get into the Holy of Holies. It's another barrier, another veil. You go through that, there's the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies. There's a lot of detail we could go into about the physical structures, the wings of the cherubim. I mean, all of these things are symbols of the exact same thing. And it's interesting, for those of you who have followed the feast structures, and we'll dive into this more in just a moment, but there's this time in the Holy of Holies, only once a year, a single priest was able to enter in and live. I suppose theoretically they could enter at any time, but they would die. <laughs> um, but once a year, they could go beyond this sort of last veil, barrier, into this last chamber... And life could actually be created. That was on the Day of Atonement. Galatians 3.29, and this is a concept we see throughout Scripture. Galatians 3.29 says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The word seed, in Greek, is sperma. And it essentially means exactly what it means in English. <laughs> The Bible, a lot of times, has no problems talking about things that make us uncomfortable. We need to stop being uncomfortable about these things. So anyways, once a year, on the day of Yom Kippur, a single seed of Abraham was able to enter into this last chamber and life would be created. You're like, okay, whatever, this is getting weird. 
I don't agree with any of this. This sounds like some sort of weird fertility cult. You ever thought maybe those fertility cults were a deviation or a perversion of what the Father actually intended? I mean, like every act of worship. Satan can't create. He can only just distort what's already there. You say, well, this is, I still don't buy it. And I get it. It's, it's different. But like I said, I'm on that motorbike jumping off into crazy. If you look at the coverings of the tabernacle, why, how many coverings were there? They're not going to be in this picture. They're layers. There are four coverings. Why four? A tent does not require four coverings. To keep the rain off or to keep the wind out or whatever. One, a leather covering would have sufficed. And that's what it had on the top. But there are these four layers. So if this is a biological model of something that we experience in creation, this place where God was to come and dwell and to know with humanity, where humanity would enter in and have this intimate relationship with God, why are there four coverings? The first covering was skin. Some translations will say it was badger skin. Essentially, it's skin, it's flesh, it's leather, whatever you want to call it. It looked like skin, looked like leather, looked like your own body's skin. If you go beyond that, there's this sort of red, ram skin dyed red is what it's described as. But essentially it's sort of this muscular, like another kind of leather structure. But for some reason it's dyed red. Why? Who knows? Beyond that, you get to this layer of woven goat hair. It's this really fibrous tissue that was kind of roughly put together that would kind of be the third layer. And then once you get all the way in, there was this linen covering. Linen kind of being the universal symbol of purity and righteousness and goodness. So you have all of these things, these four layers. And people have taught all sorts of things about the different meanings. You know, we kind of turn this into our little, you know, those Christian bracelets with little colors on them that give you the salvation process. Um, I've heard teachings like that. But on a very physical level, has anyone here ever performed a C-section? I've seen one, and let me tell you. <laughs> whew, there's some things you can't unsee, um, and there's some things you wish you'd never seen. Um, when someone, when a doctor is performing a C-section, they have to make a series of cuts. The first cut is through a leathery substance called skin. The second cut, second significant cut, is they actually have to cut through the abs, the abdomen, this red muscular tissue. The third cut, and this is actually the most difficult cut, is there is this fibrous tissue, this kind of white fibrous tissue called fascia that kind of holds all your insides together. I have to cut through that. The next cut, and sort of the final cut before you can actually extract the baby, is they have to cut through the actual uterus. So again, you have these exact same things, these four structures, these four layers that are sort of separating the holy place from the external world. And it's all a symbol of the womb. Everything we see in the tabernacle, and the tabernacle represents many, many, many things. But ultimately, it is this womb. It is this place where life was created. Or you could say that the womb that we have, not me personally, but um, the womb that 51% of the world has is actually a symbol that was designed by God to showcase this level of intimacy. And so why do you think it is that Satan is constantly warring against women's bodies? On every level, whether it's abortion or objectification or insecurities or, you know, disease, so many different things for thousands of years. It's been the battleground. In scripture, there's this word, raham, rahamim. Essentially what it means is mercy. The Bible talks about God's tender mercies, but it also is the Hebrew word for womb, or the uterus, if you want to get biologically correct. 
And the promise that we see in the tabernacle is that within this womb, this is where God would dwell with his people. You know, God brought the Israelites out of Egypt. He wanted to have this relationship with them. He brought them to Mount Sinai. Originally, it doesn't seem as though the intent was to have a priesthood or to have even necessarily a structure. He just wanted to have a relationship with them. And even in their purity, he was like, don't let them get too close to the mountain because I'm going to kill them. They're still not pure enough. So in order to accommodate this thing, they build the tabernacle. They institute the priesthood. They put these layers of separation and representatives between that intimacy that God ultimately wanted to preserve the people. Later on in Revelation, the temple, which was, of course, came from this, the temple is described as the bride. We are also described as the temple. We're also described as the bride. There's the symbolism that we see in all of Scripture. And the reality is that for me, even as a husband, I will never be a good husband or father until I actually first learn how to be a good bride. And that's true for every one of you. And for a lot of us uh, who try to imagine that we might one day become manly men, um, that's not an easy concept to uh, absorb. But it's the truth. And so even if figuratively, if we are that temple, we are that tabernacle of God, we are the bride, we are this womb, we are this place where the spirit is able to indwell and we're able to have this intimacy with God. And through all of this, these acts of worship, these times of worship, that's where life is created. And for us, it's the gift of eternal life. That's one layer. Who knows what this is? And when I'm growing up, I was one of nine kids, so this thing was always laying around the house. If you're pregnant, when you become pregnant, before the internet, this is how you figured out when your baby was going to be due. Little wheel, you spin it around, you line it up with the dates, and it does a little prediction. So if we take that same wheel, and instead we insert the Hebrew, biblical months, and there's different names for them, I'm not getting into that today. Put that on top. Take those same things and put the primary biblical feasts on top of them. And I just went ahead and put this year's feast dates as they per relate roughly. And if you're on a different calendar, God bless you. I'm just glad you're celebrating something. And actually, if you're on a different calendar, this even gets more accurate. But, um, but these are sort of the official Jewish uh, dates for when these feasts occur as they pertain to the American Gregorian calendar. So if we take that same calendar, the, the gestation calendar, and give it a little spin to line it up with the actual feast, we start to see something that never really made sense to me before. You know, I've been keeping the feasts for 25 years or something, and it never really made sense to me, the timing, the rhythm, the pattern, the cycles. But then you start to look at this stuff, and it starts to make sense. So I'm going to walk through this kind of start in September and work our way around. There is this moment. Feast of Trumpets. Who celebrated the Feast of Trumpets before? Yom Teruah. Call it whatever you want. It's this moment where a trumpet is sounded and it's at the day and the hour that no man knows. And, you know, for a lot of people, we see that as a prophetic picture of the Messiah's return, the bridegroom coming back for the bride. If you've studied anything about the ancient Jewish wedding customs, you know that that is essentially how a bride would, or how a groom would be announced. Um, they would blow a trumpet at sort of in the middle of the night and the groom would arrive and take the bride. Then, the next feast is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The next feast after that is Sukkot. Everybody loves Sukkot? If you're not doing Sukkot this year, do Sukkot this year. You ain't got no excuse not to. This stuff's supposed to affect your life. If it doesn't affect your finances, you're doing it wrong. So go to Sukkot, whatever it takes. In Sukkot, in the ancient Jewish wedding customs, there was this time when people got married, they had a seven-day celebration. Marriage supper of the Lamb, if you will where they would get together and they would dwell together with their entire community. They would bring in all their neighbors and friends and have this wedding feast that lasted for seven days. 
But there's that feast in between that we haven't talked about. And for some reason, I, I don't ever hear it talked about in the same metaphor. But in the ancient Hebrew Jewish wedding customs, there's this moment between what the Feast of Trumpets or when the groom arrives and when you actually get to the marriage supper, that week-long celebration. And it was the moment when the marriage was actually consummated, when they actually became married. They would actually do the marriage supper after that. It was the week that followed. And so here we have the Day of Atonement. And like I said, it's that day, once a year, where the covenant was sealed, where the people of God, where life was given. And so if we look at these things, um, the entire feast structure in the Hebrew calendar operates on these cycles of new moons. Um, the new moons, essentially, it's every 28.5 days, if you want to get mathematical with it, but it's essentially every 28 days there's a new moon. Nod your heads if you've heard all this. Yes, yes, I'd rather not have to explain it, but we can. Um, so then the moon goes through its cycles, and there's a new moon. After the new moon... Or upon the new moon, that starts the new month. So the Feast of Trumpets occurs on a new moon. So what else in biology, the entire tabernacle, everything's structured on this new moon cycle. What else in our human biology operates on a 28-day cycle? Someone actually said it. Oh my goodness. And men, if you didn't hear it, talk to your wives. You know, people would be like, oh, that's just a coincidence. Why on earth would God make that just a coincidence? You know, these things happen. These are patterns and pictures. Even in our biology. Even in the womb. Even in the tabernacle. So what happens in the biblical uh, customs, essentially, is after a new moon, if you will, within your marriage, there's actually a seven-day time of separation where the husband and wife are supposed to be separated. After that, so if we do, if we start at trumpets... Go a week. The next big holiday that we get is that Yom Kippur. It's that time when the marriage is actually consummated. So the groom arrives, but it's not the right time. We then get to actually consummate the marriage on, the, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It then triggers the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we go on. So then we get to the spring feasts, which a lot of us have just experienced. We've got Passover, we've got the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we've got First Fruits. They all kind of you know, fall right in line with each other right at the same time. But they're three unique feasts. And then you go again, and this is kind of where we are in the natural as well, so it's timely. But what's the next feast? Davuot. And I don't know if you're, if you're like me, Shavuot is this thing that we're supposed to count to, it's this thing we're supposed to anticipate, but it also kind of seems pretty arbitrary. Like it's not really a spring feast, technically, because there's three, and then there's three, and then there's this random one kind of in the middle. Almost like a summertime feast. Why? Why the timing of it? If you see on the chart, so essentially if the marriage... Bridegroom comes, the marriage is consummated, marriage is celebrated. These other circles here, these are called trimesters. The timing actually works out essentially perfect every single year. You get into this pattern and this rhythm that ultimately what is, de what is conceived in the fall feast ultimately is delivered or produced at Shavuot. It's this pattern we see over and over and over again in Scripture. And the reality is, if any of you did conceive a child um, on Yom Kippur <laughs> at Tabernacles, your child would be full term by the time Shavuot rolls around. Because it takes 37 weeks to actually be full term. It takes 40 weeks to kind of max it out. If you want to go that long. But essentially, it's that moment where this thing is viable, this thing is alive, this thing is happening, and we're cleared to go. Then we look historically at what actually happened on these dates. 
If we throw in the other holidays, we got Hanukkah and Purim that we celebrate. And both of those, those are times when the enemies of God sought to destroy the seed of Abraham. It just happens to randomly fall essentially on the marks of the various trimesters. Oh, someone was taking notes. I heard an oop. Uh, so I'm going to leave that there. So we have this pattern. We have this thing. And then what we know happened at Shavuot. The Holy Spirit was delivered. And the commandments were delivered at Mount Sinai. So on both of these occasions, you know, thousands of years apart from each other and definitely thousands of years from where we are today, there was this historic moment of something actually being brought forth and delivered at Shavuot. And I think for us as believers, Shavuot is really the holiday that I most identify with because we're in that season between the spring feast and the fall feast, spiritually. We're in those days of waiting for something to be delivered. And I think we're starting to see pieces of it. You know, Scripture talks about in John about worshiping in spirit and truth. The Holy Spirit and the Torah are interesting concepts because even in Hebrew, they're uh, feminine words. You know, it's a gendered language, so words are either masculine or feminine. Ruach and Torah are both feminine words. And so it's interesting that on this day in history, this day of Shavuot, two feminine things essentially were brought forth. We know as the bride, we're supposed to have that spirit and truth. If we incorporate all of that into our lives... You know, it does take, even in the physical, even in your biology, it takes two female chromosomes to make a female. Men are only half female. <laughs> but it takes these two spiritual things, these two symbols coming together, the Holy Spirit and the commandments of God to come together to bring out the bride. And so I'll close with this. We are at this moment in history. We're at this moment even this year, coming up on it, where Shavuot is upon us. We are ready for something to be delivered. And I think the promise of Shavuot, and if you've gone through the fall feast, you know, what I want to assure you of today is that the, that thing that God promised you back in the fall feast will come to pass, it will be delivered. And I know for me, this is something I've seen time and time again in my life, is that there's this experience where Father does speak at his feast. I have seen promises that he's given me at Yom Kippur and other events actually come true at Shavuot. So this is a time for us to uh, be anxiously anticipating the things of the Father. Be excited about what's to come. Understand that our worship, our bodies, everything that we do is all supposed to be in sync with his will. It all reveals his truth. And together, we have this exciting moment to look forward to every single year. So I want to close with a prayer. Um, let's pray. Father in heaven, We want to thank you and bless you for all that you do for us. For your kindness, for your mercy, Father. I want to thank you that you do desire to draw us into this relationship. That you've given us this model and this example for us to follow in our lives, Father. Reveal the truth about what you want for us, Father. I ask, Father, that for every person here who is currently waiting for the, something that you've promised them to be delivered, Father, that they would know that that delivery is coming. That the good work that you've started, you will carry through to fruition, Father. And that this season of Shavuot, this would be a time of growth, a time of expansion, a time of fruitfulness, Father. In each and every one of our lives, Father, give us the courage and the wisdom and the strength of integrity. Stand true to your word, to hold you to your promises. More importantly, to hold ourselves to your promises, Father. 
Bless our families. Bless our, our mothers and wives and daughters. Especially, Father, who do face so many struggles in this life. As Satan tries to war against them, Father, I ask that you would give all of us the wisdom to know how to move forward and to prepare our hearts. In his name we pray. Amen. Instead of building more walls, yeah. let's build more bridges. Yeah. Let's build more bridges. Yeah.